number five. Try not to wear out these verses early on in the year, but there's so much good in them. And uh, we just want to follow the direction of the Lord in this new year of reconciliation. Looking forward to what God is going to do through that work of reconciliation. Uh, looking there again in Second Corinthians 5, we're going to look at verses 18 and 19. I was uh, reading this article in the study uh, by Denise uh, Locke. I believe that's how you say her name this week. And uh, there's a lot of good information, a lot of good stuff in there. And uh, just powerful, just trying to do, do research and study. When God gives me a theme, I just, whatever that word is, I just take it and I dive into it and I dissect it and I pray over it. And I just, anything I can find, any study I can find, uh, get into it. And uh, that just lining up with what the Word of God says. And, and I believe the Lord's want to, to just speak to us and, and touch us and, and bring strength in and through us. And I want to talk tonight about pursuing reconciliation, pursuing the ministry of reconciliation. So uh, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. He says, Paul once again there, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful tonight for your word. Thankful for the goodness that we find in your word and the strength that we receive from your word. And we just ask you, Father God, to anoint us, speak to us, and speak through us this evening. And we'll be careful to give you the praise for it, the honor for it, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, And the church said, Amen. You may be seated. Uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That was the words that Abraham Lincoln spoke on June 16th, 1858. He was in the, there in front of his Republican colleagues in Springfield, Illinois, in the State House. He had just been chosen to run against Stephen Douglas for the United States Senate. He had a law partner then by the name of William Herndon, and he questioned his use of such a strong statement uh, that uh, asking him, how can you say such a thing? If you really want to go anywhere politically, what he's telling him, you need to get away from statements like that. Uh, he was uh, speaking to him and, uh, and saying to him and trying, I guess, to, to give him some political wisdom. Uh, but as you study the life of Abraham Lincoln, he wasn't too concerned about those kind of things. Uh, he wanted more of God's will. We need more politicians like that today. But the, the preposition here is uh, indisputably true, he said, and I will deliver it as written. He said, I want to use some universally known figure expressed in simple language as a universally known that it may strike home to the minds of men in order to rouse them to get their peril of the times. Uh, what Lincoln was saying there, his famous statement, uh, the reason that Abraham Lincoln could say, I'm sticking to what I said, he's basically saying what is written is written. What I, the statement that I wrote there is the statement that I am going to speak. Uh, how could he say that with such confidence? Well, the famous statement is a paraphrase of the words of Jesus recorded in Mark chapter 3, verse 25, when Jesus said, and If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So Lincoln was right because Jesus is always right. Lincoln said, I'm not changing what I had to say because what I had to say came from the one that said, it is written. The one that knows, uh, he said, I have got uh, my resources uh, from the Word of God. Can I tell you tonight, child of God, uh, when you have got your resources uh, from what thus saith the Word of God, uh, remember what we just read there, uh, not only will he give us the ministry of reconciliation, uh, he will give us the word uh, of reconciliation. Not talking about the second word uh, in that uh, statement there, 
that title, uh, not just God hands us a word of reconciliation, uh, but the word uh, of reconciliation, the gospel uh, that is all about uh, reconciliation. So Lincoln was right because Jesus uh, is always right. Can I tell you uh, that when you deliver uh, the word of God, uh, when you stay within the pages of this book, uh, our lives are supposed to be an open epistle. uh, And when we live the word of God, it may not be popular. Some may say you might want to water that down a little bit uh, so it can be taken a little bit. You might want to put some sugar on that uh, so it's a little easier to swallow. Uh, We say no, 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 like Lincoln did. Uh, A house uh, that stands against itself, uh, it cannot stand. Uh, It will fall no matter what you bring from the word. Uh, There's a lot of strong language found in the word of God uh, that this world cannot handle. Uh, We're living in a time that uh, people are offended by everything but sin. And so Lincoln said, no, I'm going to stand on that. So when you bring your message, when you live your life in accordance to the Word of God, friend, don't back up on that. Don't, don't backpedal on that. Don't start to, well, I, 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 I didn't really mean it that way. I, I didn't mean to, to, to say it that way. As a young minister, I I preached, you may think I preach hard now, I preached real hard to to some, preached strong, I should say, with a lot of conviction, still do, but I would, many times after I would get through preaching and after uh, the anointing would begin to subside a little bit, I guess, and I would come back to the pulpit, I was kind of, as a man, feeling guilty and said, I'm sorry, I was so hard on y'all tonight. My dad pulled me aside one time and said, son, preach the word, that's fine, but never apologize for preaching the word. So I had to make some adjustments over the years to, to know that I, I can't afford not to preach the word, uh, but also I can't afford to preach uh, as a man being hard on people. Uh, I, I've seen too many that say, uh, well, they, they bragged on the message they preached uh, and saying I nailed their hide to the wall. It's never my place uh, to have a bunch of hides nailed to the wall uh, as trophies, uh, but it's my place to reach the broken uh, and the hurting uh, and let people no, you can't abound and abide in sin, uh, that you can't be divided, that we've got to be in harmony, we've got to be in unity uh, with God's Word, and that's what, uh, that's what Lincoln not only wanted in the Senate, that's what he wanted in the White House, that's what he wanted uh, for our country. Like I said, I wish we had more uh, men leading our country uh, that would go to the Word of God uh, and not look in the Word of God. Too many uh, politicians, too many preachers, too many business owners uh, are wanting to say something and trying to find something in the Word of God uh, that fits what they want to say. Uh, It's time that we get back to the Word of God uh, and say what the Word of God says. Uh, Say what He says to say. Uh, So unity is that foundation of everything we value. Everything. Peace and love and respect and purpose. Just like Lincoln's colleagues, we need to be reminded of what's crucial to awaken us to what we know the perils Lincoln was talking about the perils of that time in the 1800s. All these years later, the perils of our time. We're living in a a wicked world. We're living in a world that I I shared with you the statistics this morning that over 90% of the world that we live in don't even profess salvation. And 10% of those that do profess it, I think it's a hope so, maybe so, think so. But we're living in a sad time. And we're living in a time that we need to be purposeful people. We need to be a people who is pursuing uh, uh, to see how God wants to bring back uh, a people that will be reconciled to Him. I I preached this morning, be ye reconciled uh, to God. We need to be reconciled to God. We need to deliver that message to let others know that there is a way to be reconciled for God. And we long for that unity because why do we long for that unity? Because the Creator placed that desire in our hearts. Romans 12 and 3 tells us that he has dealt to each man the measure of faith. So uh, it does not matter if you're sitting on a church pew or a bar stool. There is something within every man, woman, boy, and girl that longs for and desires something more. Every person saying there's more to life 
than this. Jesus gave the answer in the latter part of John 10 and 10. He said, there is. I have come that you can find that that you're looking for, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Unfortunately, some folks are thinking it's going to be in the end of the next beer bottle. Some are thinking it's going to be in the, the bottom of that next fifth. Uh, it's going to be in the, at the end uh, of that uh, whatever that wacky weed uh, cigarette they have. Uh, or it's going to be at the end of the line that they snored. Or it's going to be found uh, in that syringe. Or, or it's going to be found uh, in that next relationship. Uh, it's going to be found uh, in that next place. Uh, maybe I'll find it uh, within the realms uh, of this uh, internet that site uh, and people are looking through for it uh, and they become addicted. Why? Because everyone uh, is looking for something. Uh, everyone has a desire uh, in their hearts uh, and we have to understand that when sin entered into that or this world, uh, that disunity followed uh, and conflict came on the scene. Uh, do you realize uh, that Adam and Eve not only walked with God in the cool of the day, uh, Scripture not only tells us that they were naked it, uh, and knew it not, uh, but can you imagine uh, married couples in the house? Uh, can you imagine uh, going all week, all month, all year, no arguments, no disagreements? They never disagreed on what restaurant they were going to eat at because there were none. Somebody said the other day that a couple that is madly in love can agree on everything except for where to eat. They didn't have to worry. They were, what I'm saying is they were in unity. There was perfect unity. And God came down and gave instruction to them of what to do and what not to do. He said, of every tree of the garden you shall surely eat, but of that tree. And what was that tree? The knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch that tree. And so that's the tree that the devil used to entice isn't it amazing that what God says, leave alone? And, and that's our inbred nature uh, as children, uh, as toddlers. The very thing that mom and dad says not to do, for some reason, we want to do it. Don't get in that mud puddle in your church clothes, and that mud puddle just draws us. Don't, don't, uh, don't mess with that, uh, the, that candy uh, before dinner, and somehow we just get that candy. We get into those things, but it does not stop as a toddler, does it? It continues on through our adolescence and our adolescence and our teenage years. I don't know what the rules were for you. Uh, my rules are much stricter now than what the rules were for me uh, as a kid, but uh, we would ride our bicycles, and we had a two-block radius from around our house uh, that we can go. Now, a two-block radius in any direction is a pretty good bit of square uh, feet or square miles even to cover pretty good good direction there in Ferndean. It almost uh, covered a good part of the island, or at least our side of the island. Uh, but for some reason, uh, the two-block radius was not good enough for me and my brothers. Uh, three blocks sounded more uh, like what we wanted to do, and four blocks uh, sounded even better. Uh, and if we could get six blocks away, uh, we could get down there where we could ride our bicycles uh, off of this loading dock. Uh, and that was a lot more fun than what we had in our two-block radius radius. Uh, it becomes the mindset uh, of saying, I want to push the boundary. Uh, I want to go further uh, than what I'm supposed to do. Uh, so that's what Adam and Eve did. They partook of that, uh, that God said to leave alone. Uh, and then all of a sudden, everything that was good with Adam and Eve uh, and everything that was good and what surrounded them, you know what came on the scene? Conflict. Adam, where art thou? Did you eat of the tree that I said to leave alone? That woman that you gave me, that woman that you, I was doing good by myself, and you thought that I needed uh, one of my ribs to be turned into a woman, uh, and you gave me a woman, uh, and she gave me to eat, uh, and the woman said, no, 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 uh, it wasn't me, it was that snake, it was that serpent uh, that did it, uh, and then all of a sudden there's conflict, uh, and conflict has to be dealt with. Uh, that conflict rained down uh, into their children, Cain uh, and Abel, uh, one killing the other, uh, conflict 
conflict began to spiral into a vortex uh, of disharmony uh, that not only stayed there with Adam and Eve uh, and their early offspring, but down throughout the generations. Uh, nobody takes responsibility uh, for their actions. Uh, it's always uh, a blame game. Uh, it's always uh, somebody else's fault. Uh, you can see on the news uh, that the kid's there with a smoking gun in his hand uh, with a dead person at his feet, uh, and they say, no, he was a good boy. Uh, I would imagine that he'd ever done something like that. Uh, it must have been somebody else's fault. And conflict begins to arise. We get into a place that we think uh, that we're doing good. Uh, we, we get to a place uh, that we have great men of God uh, like Martin Luther King Jr. that we're going to celebrate uh, his time uh, here in a week or so uh, that was a true man uh, that believed in unity, uh, that believed what he stood for and marched for. Uh, I believe he would be sick to his stomach uh, of that that's done in his name today. Uh, but what he believed, Grace and I were talking about uh, this the other day. Uh, and it, to him, uh, it was really not about the color of a man's skin. When Martin Luther King Jr. said, I'm uh, looking for a day when the man uh, is judged by the character of his heart uh, and the color of his skin, uh, he meant that both ways. I truly believe that. I never met him personally, but everything I've studied and everything I've seen uh, about this man. Uh, so we thought that we were gaining ground. We thought uh, that we we're getting somewhere. You know me. I'm not uh, the real political type, uh, but we were doing real good uh, and we seem to be gaining ground uh, then all of a sudden there's a shift uh, all of a sudden there's a conflict that begins to rise somebody flips a switch uh, somebody pushes a button uh, somebody makes a dumb statement uh, somebody does something to do what uh, to bring divide once again uh, we've got more racial division uh, than we've seen in years uh, because of what's going on why is that uh, we can say well, it's the Republicans' fault, or it's the Democrats' fault. It's the Black Lives Matter's fault. Oh, it's those skinheads. It's their fault. It's the radical right, the radical left. No, it's the same one that slivered into the garden. Same one that got in Eve's ear is doing the same thing, bringing disharmony. The devil knows that if he can keep us divided, he knows that a house divided against itself will never stand. We've set this, uh, men like Abraham Lincoln said, we're one nation under God, and they believe that, stood for that, uh, and the devil knows that, uh, that this nation uh, that you would not find in biblical time is now uh, built upon and founded upon, uh, not just a God, not just any God. Uh, when we say one nation under God, it's not one God under Buddha, it's not one God under in place, free, just uh, insert your God here, uh, but it's one nation under Jehovah God. It's one nation uh, under the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords. Uh, and the devil says, uh, the only way uh, that I can bring destruction to them is if I bring disharmony. He hasn't stopped with the nation. He hasn't stopped with families. He's come after the church as well. If I can get them to look past the Word and see where they disagree, I got them. Churches have been divided over the color of carpet. There's been churches that's gone into rebuilds and remodels and split in half. We have so many churches. People ask why we have so many churches today. Well, a lot of those reasons is because there was disharmony. People couldn't get along. I told you about a pastor friend of mine years ago went to a church, and they voted him and his pastor. And as soon as he got there, the Lord spoke to him and said, this church is a result of the split. You need to tell him go home. This is his livelihood now. He's voted in as pastor of that church, uh, and he, he didn't know. Nobody told him uh, the history. God told him that. So when he spoke up uh, and said, the Lord told me this is uh, a part of a split. Eyeballs got that big, I'm sure. Uh, and he said, well, I'm telling you what the Lord told me. Uh, he said, I'm going to lead the way. Uh, we're going to go back to where we came from, where you came from, where you started at, because that's what God said too. Thank God there was obedient people uh, that followed, and God brought unity, and God 
God brought direction uh, and pulled that back together. Uh, but the devil wants to bring disharmony. Uh, but we need people to begin to say, uh, I can't water it down and sugarcoat it. I know uh, that what the devil is trying to do is not just plague humanity. Uh, he's trying to destroy the church because he knows the end of the story. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came as that second Adam to end the conflict. But notice that word might. Again, I shared that with you this morning, that we might have reconciliation, that we might have it more life and life more abundantly. You know what Jesus has done? He's put the ball in our court. He said, I've given you access. I, I, I've given you access to the kingdom. I've given you access to eternal life. But people are conflicted within themselves because there's an allure and a draw from the world. That looks good. Same thing. We wonder how could Eve mess with that tree when there was all those other trees? Why? How come we've messed with all uh, that sin when there's so much goodness of God? Same thing. There's a conflict inside of folks. Uh, and, but he's come to restore unity between God and sinners. Uh, and so Paul's letter uh, there in the first century churches, he used that term. Uh, it, God has made our theme for this year, reconciliation. Uh, it's an act of reconciling or being reconciled. Uh, as we said in the beginning uh, last week, coming to terms uh, with a new uh, mo- a way of moving forward. Uh, we were moving and we were living uh, in the flesh. But when we've been born again of an incorruptible seed, now there's a new life that we're living. Living for God's a wonderful thing. It's a grand and glorious feeling. But when you've spent your whole life living for the world, that takes some adjustment. The flesh says, what are we doing? Right? Can I get an amen, Brother Paul? Yeah, what for 40 years or for 50 years or for 30 years or 20 years, however long uh, you lived in this world before uh, uh, surrendering your life completely to God, uh, this flesh did whatever it wanted to do. Uh, and now God is saying, uh, I'm saving you because uh, of this renewed commitment. Uh, and now reconciliation is coming to terms with that. Uh, coming, coming to terms. Uh, we can just say coming to terms with a Galatians 2 and 20 mentality it's no longer I it's no longer me it's living it's Christ that's living through me because if it was me that was living I'd be wherever I was at before doing whatever I was doing before but now I'm not living for me I'm living for the glory of God so reconciliation is coming to terms with a new and a living way. Sinful people have been separated from the holy God ever since Adam and Eve tasted of that fruit from the garden And what was that tree again? The knowledge of good and evil. People just want to be smart. They just want to prove that they're smart. Amy and I was talking about it today. I said, it's like somebody wants to come up with something that nobody's ever heard before. And may, oh, they're smart. Solomon, the smartest man that ever lived, said there's nothing new under the sun. So if you think you found something new, if it's truth... It's already been said before. I've thought over the years, man, I've come up with a great, great thing, uh, only to find out the Lord placed on my heart a message uh, one time, uh, and and I got it uh, straight from the throne room of God, straight from a prayer closet. I've preached it many times when I was evangelized, and I've preached it many times uh, since pastor. It's a message entitled, Suddenly. Man, if I've ever enjoyed preaching a message, I've enjoyed preaching that message. And I thought, man, nobody's ever uh, seen it like this. Nobody's ever delivered it like this. Uh, One day I was scrolling through uh, YouTube, uh, and I saw a title, Suddenly. Our now general overseer, uh, general uh, General overseer Bishop Tim Hill, uh, one of the greatest preachers I think you would ever hear preach in the church of God. Uh, His message title was Suddenly. I said, huh, that's interesting. Uh, hit play uh, and begin to hear him preach uh, suddenly same text every story I used he used and I'm thinking everybody probably thinks that I preached Tim Hill's message if they saw that because he preached it long before I did so everybody thinks man I've got something new I've got something fresh and sometimes people just go too far with trying to look smart 
And sometimes when you're trying to look smart, you don't look so smart. I won't use the other words. And Adam and Eve, they tested that by taking of that fruit of the tree of knowledge and good of evil. But Jesus, Jesus took and he came and he came to restore that brokenness. He came to reconcile. He did that through his death and resurrection. He made reconciliation possible. But God commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and 8 in verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Aren't you thankful for that? That Jesus satisfied God's requirements for reconciliation. I'm glad he came. Oh, I hate it that Jesus had to go through what he went through. But one that's been redeemed, and one that needed to call upon his name and accept that price that was paid. I'm glad that he paid that price. Uh, it was with that for each person must receive the terms, though, of that reconciliation. Uh, we can't just say uh, that it was satisfied, uh, and so it's satisfied everyone is righteous now. No, we have to come to terms with that. Uh, we have to accept that that price was paid for us uh, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on what he did for us. Uh, and believe is not just saying, yeah, I believe, but believing is living a new life that says it's no longer about me, but it's about that reconciliation that took place. He said this, Paul did in Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We've heard this called the Roman road to salvation. ABCs of salvation salvation is simple why is it simple because jesus did all the work he did all of the reconciling we just have to accept the invitation we have to accept the reconciler's tug to say turn it over to me turn it over to me Think about what I said this morning, that he takes trade ends, push, pull, tug, or tow. Uh, when we push, pull, tug, and tow in our life, and we're trying to hold on to this wretched life. Paul said, this wretched man that I am, what are we holding on to? What are we holding on to? I'm sure over the years, Brother George has seen some folks that he wanted to put them in a better vehicle because the one that they were trying to get him to work on every week was not worth working on anymore. And he probably looked back at it and said, why are you holding on to it? Why I can get you over here, and, and we, we'll take this off of your hands. And, and I've known Brother George to help people out over the years uh, in that fashion, in that matter. Just a heart for people to say, we can get you in something better, and you don't have to call me <laughs> every week to come and pick you up off the side of the road. You don't have to have a tow truck on speed dial. When we wonder what you're holding on to. I wonder sometimes when I see people so wretched and so broken, so addicted, I don't understand it. I, I was telling Paul the other night, I was up here teaching, and it's Jesus is praying in the garden, and he goes a little bit further, and he prays, and he's praying in agony. He comes back, and he looks, and they're asleep. How can you sleep in a time like this? I told Brother Paul, I said, I wanted to say there in the middle of the service, I feel you, Jesus. We look and we see what we're going through, and there's a drawing, and there's an agony, and there's a pursuit of reconciliation. There's a pursuit of the things of God uh, and a deeper relationship. We're saying in times like these, uh, I need to pray, and they're saying in times like these, I think I'll take a nap. And then we say, what are you sleeping for what are you holding on to uh, what what is it not their life is in shambles and it's broken and you're offering to them a new and a living way that uh, there is nothing better than serving the lord i know that i'm not the most look good looking guy in the world and i don't have it all together but I try to live an example of a pure and clean life and to be able to those that i grew up with family and friends to say look where I could have been and look where I am and some may say well you're not rich oh yeah I'm a poor poor rich man 
because my possessions, I realize, are not rooted here. I am not rooted into material things. I, I'm not, uh, it's not about my possessions. Uh, hey, I'm not talking about, well, you're so broke, why don't you give Jesus a try? Uh, but it's, you're so broke uh, in the spiritual aspect, uh, and you're so addicted, and you're so tied down to this world, uh, trying to witness to someone the other day. Uh, and I said, don't you realize uh, that the Lord is reaching us by the mercy and the grace of God? Uh, and they came back, and they said, see, that's where I have the problem. I'm kind of upset with God because he let this one pass away. He took this one from me, and they just went on and on and on. This person's kin to me, so I said, uh, excuse me, we were on the phone. I said, every person you've ever lost, I lost them too. That was not God's fault. I said, you see it much differently than I see it. I said, you see it as God took them, but I see it as God was there with me when they were taken because of sin, because of sickness, because of whatever it was that they allowed to enter into their lives for their life here to end or for whatever case or whatever reason. It was not God that took them, but it was God that came in and lifted me up. Why? Because I, I fell on his mercy and I fell on his grace and you can fall on his mercy and you can follow in his grace uh, and we begin to ask what are you waiting for what are you holding back on to know that if thou shalt confess with him that we can be saved and so that just catapults us reconciled people into pursuing not just reconciliation for ourselves, but he says that when we've been reconciled immediately immediately we've been given the ministry of reconciliation and he said, in order to fulfill the ministry of reconciliation, you're going to need the word of reconciliation. So we step out, and so now when we're talking about pursuing reconciliation, we're talking about now we've pursued reconciliation for ourselves. We've been reconciled. So now we're pursuing the ministry of reconciliation. So once our relationship with God has been restored and been reconciled, uh, we are called into a service. God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, according to verse 18. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, as we shared this morning in 20 and 21. So God has commissioned each one of us who have been reconciled to share with others the message of love and peace, the gospel. The gospel. We don't need to present to them. I don't want to know that I am out here presenting to someone my good day, the good version of me. That I, I want you to see uh, what my presentation. See, a, a lot of people, you see this with celebrities, and you see this with people that's, that's on, on camera and in, in front of the camera. If you've seen this over the years, you see, and, and on the camera, they look like the nicest people in the world. But then in the time of cell phones with cameras on them, people's called them when the camera's gone off to find out they're the biggest jerks that ever walked the face of the earth. They put off this persona of treating people one way, but when the cameras are off, when they're off the platform, when they're off the stage, they're just as messed up as anybody else, if not worse. So that's not what we're trying to present. That's not the message that we're trying to get across. Paul said, preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And how do we preach Jesus Christ and him crucified? By taking the words of Galatians 2 and 20 and say it's no longer high. Taking Romans 12, 1 and 2 and being surrendered totally to him. So we need to move people towards a reconciled relationship with God. That should be our desire. God may seem, uh, it's, it may be seem like he's got a, a daunting task there. In our, our postmodern culture and the times that we're living in, uh, so many people are exalting moral and material uh, uh, things all around us, all kinds of things, and they're calling it absolute. There is no absolute truth is what they're telling us. Brian Free sings this song, says that we're living in a society today to say when people talk about truth, well, there are no absolutes. There is no absolute truth. There is an absolute truth. His name is Jesus. How do you know that? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I take him at his word. Paul told the Corinthians that we must be open 
And we must open wide our hearts, not to every wind of doctrine that blows, but showing God's compelling love, not just to flow into our hearts, but through our lives, into the lives of others. We can find that throughout the book of Second Corinthians chapter 5. I want us to look real quickly tonight at eight practical ways that we can pursue this ministry of reconciliation. I found this in this article, and I thought it was real good, so I want to share it with you. What are some of the particular ways that we can open our hearts and deliver God's loving message of reconciliation to those who don't even realize that they need it? You know what? They don't even realize that they're already searching for it. Everybody's trying to fill a void, so they drink another. They take another. They... Go in the room with another. We'll just leave it at that. One thing after another. They're searching for something. And they don't even know what they're searching for. And he's the one they're searching for. And so we have a responsibility that they may be reconciled back to him. One way we can do that is through evangelism. When God provides an opportunity, what is evangelism? You're saying, Pastor, you want us all to go out and preach weak revivals? That's what we've made, evangelism. That's what the evangelist does. I still believe in the evangelist. I still believe in revivals. I still believe that we need to have those meetings. But evangelism is so much more than that. Evangelism is taking advantage of any opportunity to share the message of reconciliation clearly with your words to the lost. Any opportunity that you find, uh, whether it's a co-worker, whether it's a family member, or whether it's a stranger, that they're out there and they desperately need peace through Jesus Christ, uh, when that door is open, walk through it. And you know what you just did? You just fulfilled evangelism. My favorite singer, I just mentioned him a few minutes ago, Brian Free, he said, that looks like love to me. That looks like the love of Jesus to me. I want it to look like the love of Jesus. Uh, how can we do that? It can be something as simple as holding the door open uh, and giving somebody a smile who's only been hollered at and frowned upon their whole lives. It could be something very simple of seeing someone hurting uh, and seeing someone who is obviously broken uh, and not walking up to them saying what's wrong because we don't need to know what's wrong. We just need to know there's something is wrong but try to find a way to minister to that need without being nosy. Number two, how many go online? Let me see your hand. Just be honest. You can say you don't, and I'll tell you you're lying. How many go online? Lift it high. Every one of us. Well, Larry didn't lift his hand, but if Sister Linda's online, he's there too. He listens to Spreaker on Wednesday night, right? She said, there's two of you. He's online. <laughs> So at some point, some way, we have access to that. We're not on there maybe all the time getting in it. But what we can do, when you get online, set some boundaries. I told you this morning, sometimes I just keep scrolling. There are some things I see, I say, that's nonsense. And I think, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind, and then I say, I can't afford to. Or I really say, I'm not wasting my time. The Bible says don't cast your pearl before swine. I am not getting into a keyboard debate with anybody. I'm not getting on there uh, in what we call uh, the online prophets. Think they've got it all figured out, and they're throwing out damnable doctrines and all of that, and, and I understand that somebody's wanting to right the wrongs, uh, but you ain't going to do it online. Uh, and so you just refuse to engage in divisive discussions on social media or share divisive posts and tweets. Uh, we need to choose instead uh, to post comments. Uh, you know the best way to counteract all of that divisiveness? Post the Scripture. Tell of the goodness of God. I text my children every morning, but I don't text them to say, be aware of all the nonsense that's going on in that world today. My son was in Atlanta last weekend, and I did. He told me he was, they were going out. I said, keep your head on a swivel. I do tell my kids that. But every morning, my message to them, my early morning message that I text to my children is not something about a news article, about the next strand of COVID, about the next idiot that's out there doing idiot things, uh, but I text them the Word of God. 
I text them the Word of God. So we take advantage uh, of that. Uh, I've been trying to do that on our church page. Uh, each day, try to put a scripture, put a word of encouragement uh, on our music ministry page. Uh, I've started a regional pastor and church leader page uh, on Facebook, and I try my best to go on there, uh, not putting what's going wrong in the world today, uh, but letting them know what is still right, uh, right here. Uh, God is still good. Uh, so don't get caught up in all of that divisiveness, those divisions, uh, but speak about God's goodness. Uh, speak about God's faithfulness. Uh, share the blessings you and your loved ones uh, experience uh, and take advantage of your online platform to give glory to God, to give glory to Him. Number three, through generosity, give a generous tip to a waiter or waitress that you can tell is having a bad day. What's it going to hurt for you to give 30% instead of 20%? What's it going to hurt you maybe even to give 50%? Maybe you go in for for just a a quick breakfast. You get a cup of coffee and a biscuit, and it's $2. It won't hurt you to put a $10 bill on that table for that waiter or that waitress that you can tell is already having a bad day at 7 o'clock in the morning. You don't know what they're going through. But I also say, be led by the Spirit. There's times that I've got that, that receipt, and now I have to get my glasses on, and I'm pulling out my calculator on my phone to make sure that I at least give them 20%, and I'm there doing that, and I don't even have to worry about the calculator because God said, give them as much as you possibly can. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I don't know what's happening, but I just put it there, and when they notice it, I just say, God bless you. We can explain. We can take that opportunity. Maybe they'll look at it. Maybe they'll notice it. Maybe they won't. But if they notice it and they give you that platform to say, why would you do do such a thing? Just explain how it's a privilege to share God's resources. That everything that you own belongs to God. So God told me to do it. What do you mean, God? Who's this God? They're going to get curious uh, about a God that talks to people like that. Uh, So be a good steward of what he's done. Number four is this, listening. Have you ever looked in the mirror and noticed that you have two ears and one mouth? That's for a reason. We should be listening twice as much as we're talking. We need to seek to understand opposing viewpoints we need to know that when people speak against the values that we hold dear we need to listen instead of just arguing we, we don't even finish hearing what they got to say before we've got a rebuttal we want to that's how arguments get started begin to listen offer thanksgiving that maybe there is a thing called pencil and paper you ever heard of that some of the most cherished possessions that i have is in my office. I've got this big bulletin board in my office. And you know what it is? It's hand-drawn pictures over the years for my children, church children that have drawn pictures for me, Sunday school kids, and pastor appreciation, birthday, or just because. I've had children sit back while I'm preaching, drawing a picture of me in the pulpit and hand it to me. Those are cherished possessions. Why? Because it's handwritten. It's from somebody's heart. It's a thankfulness and, and handwritten notes. Uh, maybe uh, there's somebody that needs that. Maybe uh, it, it may be not just a family member. It may be your mail carrier. It may be your doctor. Uh, it may be a neighbor. Take advantage of those opportunities to show thanksgiving. Uh, tell them why uh, that you consider them a blessing or why God has placed them there. If they've done something uh, to, to be kind to you. Maybe they're not Christians, but they've showed you kindness. Uh, take time to... Uh, express thanksgiving for that uh, do something to show uh, that you are appreciative of uh, of god's creation of what they've done if you've got service men and women that live in your neighborhood take time uh, to, to recognize that uh, we need uh, number six to ha- have hospitality uh, maybe we can invite a neighbor or a co-worker uh, to lunch and to a meal or or maybe uh, we can do uh, some kind of appreciation in doing that we express uh, we don't have to get them there and buy a meal to get them caught there in the restaurant so we can preach to them to show them the love of God one man said preach the gospel and when necessary use words time spent with us should show them the love of God they should see that 
And maybe uh, that they, they just time for things to slow down and to sit there and they could see the love of God in your life. Uh, share experiences maybe in those times. Just sharing what God may have did recently or, or some testimony that God has done in your relationship with God. Uh, telling them about his goodness. Uh, and a lot of people do a lot of boasting. I said the other day that grandparents love to take that wallet out. <laughs> Tell all about them grandbabies. Tell all about those children. Somebody compliments you on the way that you handle a situation, glorify God. Glorify God. Explaining that you sought his guidance in the matter. I, I love to see that in a college football or, or, or any sporting event that they're that, that reporter puts that microphone in that 21, 22-year-old kid's face and wants to talk about uh, uh, the football game and their accomplishments and how they won a championship or whatever, uh, and that, that young person stops and says, first and foremost, I want to give glory to God. Not for a football, not for the ability to play this game, uh, but he said, I just want to give glory to God. I heard one the other day say this, I want to give glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, first and foremost. And then we can talk about what happened on the ball field, saying, I am here because of him. So take advantage of every opportunity to talk about the work in our lives, the evidence of his grace, his forgiveness, his faithfulness, uh, and all the attentiveness that, that God has given to us. Uh, it, it would maybe create a hunger in somebody else's heart for that kind of relationship. Say, if God is doing that in their life, I want that. And finally, Scripture. Not lastly, but most importantly, Galatians five nineteen through 21 tells us that we have the works of the flesh. But then Galatians 5, 22, 23 tells us that we have the fruit of the Spirit. It may be a good idea for us to, to reference those scriptures. Maybe a good idea to have a postcard and on one side have the works of the flesh, on the other side have the fruit of the Spirit. Hey, we've got phones that can do anything now. Find a picture image of both of them if you don't want to carry a postcard around and keep it there, maybe there on the phone, and each day read those two lists and begin to pray and begin to ask God through prayer, asking the Spirit of God to help you uh, to produce that fruit compatible uh, with your role uh, and what he wants to do in reconciliation, and you'll find it's not going to be those works of the flesh. God, I want the fruit of the Spirit to, to be there. Uh, and knowing the conflicts and problems and frustrations that arise, uh, when you're looking at that viewpoint to say, God, uh, I don't want these things to be manifest, but I want the fruit of the Spirit to come forth. Uh, praying for His God is take time uh, to pluck out those uh, weeds of anger and defensiveness and jealousy from your heart uh, when you see them arise. Uh, when, you, when you see uh, the, the seed of it there, go ahead and deal with it. Uh, you know, you know when there's a twinge of those things beginning to arise in your life. Too many times uh, people recognize the seed of anger. They don't do anything about it and it becomes a tree. Jealousy. You knew when it started but did not deal with it. Take time. Take time. Learn to know that sometimes you just need to wait a few hours, maybe a few days before you respond to situations and circumstances. Allow that spirit to plant the right seeds in your heart. Eight ways there, and there's so many more ways, but that's just eight ways that we can fulfill to start pursuing the ministry of reconciliation. Right here on the onset of 2022, the year of reconciliation, we can get to work. First of all, being reconciled, and once we're reconciled, he said immediately he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, get the word of reconciliation, and go to work. Go to work. In closing, if we do that, we shall not fail. Lincoln ended his impassioned plea for the abolish, abolishment of slavery with these famous words. He said, the result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes delay it, but sooner or later, the victory is sure to come. The result is not doubtful, he said. You know something? That's the same for us. 
the result is not doubtful for us either. God has promised His words will accomplish what He intended for it. Isaiah 55 and 11. We sow His seed, plant, and water. But 1 Corinthians 3 and 7 says, But God gives the increase. He also tells us to stand firm in His truth and His love and the message of reconciliation that He has given us. So if we deliver that message in loving actions and words through the power of the Holy Ghost, we shall not fail to move others toward reconciliation with God, accordance with His great plan of salvation through Christ. As you stand with me tonight, realize this. One day, we're going to stand before Jesus. Now we're standing in response to His Word. One day, we're going to stand in His presence. And we're going to stand in perfect unity with not just the few saints that we go to church with on a weekly basis. But there's coming a day, church, that we're going to stand in unity with saints of every nation, every tribe, every language. You know what's going to happen there? Well, there's not going to be any divisiveness because there'll be no sin there. We'll be giving praise and honor and glory. We'll be saying, holy is the Lamb. We'll be praising Him for finishing what He started. Get home, read it. Revelation chapter 5, that we're going to praise God. I preached a message to you as, about us as the church several months ago, maybe even several years ago that we need to finish what the early church started. But how many knows that when we enter into that time and we're standing in perfect unity with all of the saints that have made it, every tribe, every nation, every language, every skin color, that we're going to be praising Him for finishing what He started. God is going to finish what He started. Will He do it with you, through you, or without you? He's going to do it. He's going to do it. And you know what I say and my prayer is, God, whatever you're doing, do it through me. Oh, I want Him to do it in me, absolutely. I want to be reconciled to God. But there's a world out there. I cannot stand idly by and know I've been reconciled to God and to know there's a world out there that has not and to say, hey, I'm good. I got mine. You get yours. No, we should be saying, God, do it through me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because He's anointed you. You may never get up here with a microphone and preach. You may never step into a classroom or teach and teach, sing a special. You may never have a gospel group but you do have a ministry. You do have a pursuit that you need to be after every day. Souls. 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 Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Are we pursuing the lost? Are we looking for opportunities? Opportunities. Father God, we want to take advantage of every opportunity you give us this week, this month, this year. Father, I, I recall Brother George saying several times in Sunday school class over the years, sharing a story of him getting in his truck and going to work every day. And first thing he would pray is, God, bring somebody across my path that I may share with them of your goodness. Lord, I remember in that story that he said that he pulled into a gas station and there was that opportunity just like you gave him that opportunity many years ago, if we have that same heart today, tomorrow, and every day, you're going to give us somebody that needs to be reconciled to you because they're everywhere. We can't save them all. But Lord God, help us to be like that little boy walking down the beach with the starfish saying, I can't save them all, but I just help save that one. And I just help save that one. And I help save that one. Oh, we want to win everybody. We want to win the world. 
God, help us to go to the ones that you lead us to and give them everything that you tell us to. Let the Holy Ghost be our God. Your word be a lamp under our feet. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and you're going to order us to walk in the light of your word that others may be reconciled to you as well. Do that work in these altars tonight, God. Whatever needs to be done in us to prepare us for the ministry of reconciliation, for the word of reconciliation in our hearts and in our hands, that we'll get to work in 2022 fulfilling this call. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you come this morning? We came saying, I need to be reconciled. Maybe you come tonight and say, I need to pursue more reconciliation. Or maybe tonight, say, I need to pursue a ministry of reconciliation. Just pray. Just talk to God about whatever it is that you're pursuing this, this evening.